request you to please take over thank you neha uh, sorry ma'am it's a new experience for me i've never done this before so no. i hope you will forgive me uh if i make so some any mistake. any help tip required we are here so no problem can you hear me yes sir yes sir please go ahead okay good well welcome uh, boys and girls i think i can say that because i'm a very much older man than most of you <laughs> uh thank you for coming to this talk on uh the challenges house the making of the challenges house uh the reason why i want to talk about the Uh, reason why i have <clears throat> called this the making of the house is because a lot of talk given by architects are always about design philosophy uh, the approach the concept the whole thing you know but then at the end of the day we have to know what is it that we are doing so i thought i'll share this interesting project journey the purpose of this lecture is how this house was made how we started the conversation with the client what were the client requirements then we talk about the environment what are the things that we have in the environment that we got to look after so what then what are the the the, the influences uh the analysis the synthesis the synergy to bring about this whole design and most importantly at the end of the day is the construction of the building now a lot of us when we start to talk about design we just talk about design as if it's a god ordained thing design I want to design. I love design, you know, and all that. But at the end of the day, what is design about? Do we really understand what 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 we mean by what it is in design? So, I like to walk you all through this. Now, whenever we approach any project, we always take it as a new journey. Every design project is a new journey. start of a new journey of discovery in the discovery we share with those involved in the creation of spaces for the use of people of course architecture don't forget after architecture is all about people right so whatever we do has to be towards for the people and to the sustainability of our environment and therefore at the end of a project it is a new sunrise and i think that's very important <clears throat> therefore with every project we do we must break through the intellectual the invisible intellectual ceiling you see the invisible intellectual ceiling is imposed on us all at every stage of our life okay you see when when we are in secondary school this is our level of the i i c <clears throat> when you go to the university for your first degree this is the tertiary undergraduate level of i i c then if you do a masters of course when i'm talking masters i'm talking about the old fashion days of masters now the masters is a very easily attained thing then of course after that you 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 have your phd all right at this level uh, uh sometimes people think that phd is the end of end all and end all it's not you know at every stage of your life when whenever you have an ic it's the benchmark they say you start from here and you go up you don't say, take take this as the end of the road and you maintain your excellence your 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 level of knowledge at a plateau because if you maintain yourself at a plateau it's only a matter of time before you start to slide down into mediocrity 
and that's not good. So we've got to overcome that. So every time when you think you have reached a level of plateau, you move your X and Y axis up to that point and make it into a zero. So at this point uh, where you are here, you move your X and Y axis over here. So that becomes zero because you start off at zero here. So you go up then at every time, every time you move your X and Y axis and you become a zero. So if you don't go to the university, but you maintain this checkpoint, you can still attain great height. And that's very important as a designer. Okay, so now we talk about design, <clears throat> a designer, but do you know construction? Do you know how to do structures? Now, if you don't know construction and you don't know structures, how are you going to design? Because if you know, if you design, you must know how to build, how to construct. You just don't say, I design and I leave it to somebody else to, to, to do the, 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 the designing, the detail, because then you have lost the thing. Now, let me give, let me, let me test uh, you guys to a simple test. Now, okay, you want to design. Can you design a cube? Now, you can design a cube. Very easy, right? But all the sides are simple, are the same. Now, if you have to do this cube, that's 25, 25 mm. Okay, 25 mm, that's about one inch by one inch by one inch cube. That's very easy. You can uh, get a little box, put water inside that, freeze that in a in, in fridge, you get a cloth a block of ice cube that's 25 mm by 25 mm by 25 mm. Or you get a styrofoam, you cut the styrofoam into a cube, or you get a block of wood and you have a have, have the cube and get the cube. Uh, so what's so difficult? Very easy. Now, so that's 25 mm by 25 mm. So now, if this same cube now gets to become 2.5 meter by 2.5 meter by 2.5 meter. Is this still going to be that simple? 2.5 meter is a bit taller than a person. So the question is, how are you going to build it? You know enough about structures about strength of your member to create something that's 2.5 meter by 2.5 meter by 2.5 meter. Okay, so now as a designer, you got to start to think how you're going to fit the bits and pieces together, how the construction joints are going to be, how the structural connections are going to be. So it gets a little bit tough. Okay, now let me take, you, take it even further. Now we want to build a cube that's 25 meter, 25 meter high, 25 meter wide by 25 meter this way. Now, 25 meter would be equivalent to seven story high building, tall building. Now, how are you going to design that cube that's seven stories high, seven stories wide, and seven stories breadth? Okay, now. That's where the complexity of designing becomes reality. Knowing how to put the bits and pieces together, using the correct size of the structures in order to create something that is aesthetically pleasing and functional. So, my friend, when you want to be a designer, the first thing you need to do is to know construction and structure. And that's what this whole Salinger's house is about. There are a lot of things that we have to do inside there. Now, when we talk about, so the, a good design is an evolution uh, of a construction between the, the, the structure, the construction and material. So the three components make a good design. So this house, which I feel is a very simple house. It's not a big house, it's in timber. But it's the manner that we conceive it, how we put it together, that makes it attractive. And this is why I think it's important.
that this lecture we we walk walk you through all these things. Okay. Now. This is the Aga Khan Award. This is the picture to show you that we were actually there. The little gentleman there was the carpenter. He was the one that built this building, this house together. It took him seven years. And the gentleman in the middle, that's the Aga Khan. And the man on his left was the king of Spain. The ceremony was at the Alhambra in Spain. Uh, so at Granada, uh, and of course that's me in the background looking at great Japanese. Now, when we do a project, we have to interpret the client's dream. It's not all about what the architect wants. Well, remember one thing: as architect, we cannot say, "Oh, my concept, oh, my philosophy, my approach." You know, the client turns around and asks the architect, architect, I'm paying for the building. It's going to be my building, but why is it your concept and your philosophy? So remember that we've got to suppress our ego in order to, to, to make the client happy. Then you go through, go through this point, analyzing the design brief, the impact of the, the site and the surrounding uh, on the approach, your design approach. Elements of the site and environment that you have to look out for. And then at the site, what are the calculated signs? You want to understand the site, you've got to understand the sun orientation, you have to understand the wind and the rain. Now, we got to build for our context. Now, that little video that you showed me just then, before we started this lecture, I think was very interesting. I hope your students learn one very important lesson that the environment of Abu Dhabi is totally unnatural. It has got no natural features, et cetera, and et cetera. What they've got there is a completely artificially created environment that's non-sustainable. And a lot of lessons from that place to teach us how we should design and what the environment should be. So that's the thing because it has got nothing to do with sun, wind, or rain. Now, we got to always look at a function, how function influences the design approach. And of course, the selection of the people who are going to build a place and the engineer. In this case, we have designed a timber building and we look for a carpenter. And then finally, how we approach the construction of the Salinger's house. This is the Salinger's house. You can see it's all completely wood. Uh, uh, a, 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 a different people have different impressions of what it is, but for us, it's just a building that was designed to fulfill the client's requirements, the functional. Now, what was it that the client wanted? What was their budget? How did we interpret the brief for them? What were the main challenges with respect to their brief? Now, Oh, oh, here's a picture to show the client. This is a picture taken at the award ceremony in uh, Umbra at the Granada. Uh, the, 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 the white man on the right and the lady, that's Mr. and Mrs. Salinger. Mr. Salinger is a Canadian. Mrs. Salinger, she's a Malaysian, she's a Malay. And the carpenter with the white uh, skull head is the carpenter. And of course, I'm on the left. Uh, now, what are their needs? So it's very important as an architect, whenever we design something, we've got to adopt, adopt the approach of humility by saying to the client, now this is what you want. We are providing you with the, the, the sort of requirements and the concept is based on your requirements. And therefore, the final message is based on what you have told us what you want. You see, because when the client hears that you are providing them with what they want, they feel very happy because they are paying you. But if you keep telling them that it's your philosophy, your idea, then you may get into a bit of trouble. Now, then it's up to us as responsible architects to address the needs with relation to the environment and the selection of the location where 
where would be the best spot to place the house to maximize on the orientation, the vistas, the direction of the wind, the setting sun, and so forth. The Salinger site was on a three acre site and it was a very big site. And uh, now, when I first met the client, it was very interesting because based on the client's uh, briefing, I came up with this triangle, two triangles juxtaposition over each other. Now, Mr. Salinger, who's a Canadian, said to me, Look, Jimmy, I would like my house to be in timber and I'd like it to express the traditional Malay cultural entity and so forth. So I said, yeah, fine, okay. And I said, what about you, uh, Monera? There's a wife. Oh, Monera said, no, I don't want the traditional Malay house. I want a complete modern type of house. I said, oh, <laughs> we've got a little problem here. Someone wants tradition, someone wants modern. So I thought, well, maybe that's a good start. I have two arrowheads, huh? one arrowhead pointing east, another arrowhead pointing west, because they are both looking different direction. And it's only in the middle that they meet, you see. So, so, so that's how this shape came about. And uh, uh, of course, I did not exactly explain to them, but I, I saw explaining about that they accepted it, which was good. Now. The site is three acres. And because it's three acres, uh, this was the highest point on the site here. And uh, it's sloped downhill towards the front on our right. Now at the bottom on our right here somewhere is a depression. So locating the house at the highest point and then at the lowest point, we decided to create a retention pond so that all the waste wastewater can be collected <clears throat> and be recycled for gardening purposes and so forth. And that went very well. Now, the site was full of old rubber trees and it was a delightful place. <clears throat> so, they, they, they wanted to build this house originally as a weekend house because uh, <coughs> Dr. Salinger was a lecturer at the university not far from the site of this house. Their initial requirements were they were going to use this as a weekend house and uh, for them to try and see how they could live in that environment because it was in those days considered to be very much in the rural area. And um, but after a while, they decided that they'll move there because of traffic between where the original house was and, uh, and, and where the university uh, became quite heavy. They, their requirements were simple. They only just wanted a one bedroom house uh, with a small guest house, and that was it. You can see from the layout from the furniture inside the house, it, it, they're very simple people. Yeah, their requirements are not uh, much, and everything was very much natural, lots of opening, and lots of natural light. I can see uh, Dr. Rudin sitting inside there, uh, reading without being put on the light. Here are other views. This is a view of the little uh, 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 pavilion outside the, 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 the deck, and this is another corner of the living room. Uh, where the, 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 the structure comes together. So they're very basic, very, uh, the, the furniture are very uh, tropical and so forth. Here's another view, this is a view of a little kitchen alcove, this is the dining area. Uh, the, the, the very simply furniture is simply essential. Now, the site that we put our building on is always a very important thing, the site is environment. And these are two aspects which most architects tend to forget, but to us they are very important. So we must understand the site. The site that they have is 
is an old Rafa estate. It's, uh, it's undulating, and uh, and that became a very important influencing factor on in how we design. And it was an old rubber estate, and there were lots of greenery, and the terrain had a major impact on how we designed the building. Because when you are on a, on a little hill, there's a lot of uh, cross ventilation air movement. Because as you know, uh, hot air rises. So when hot air rises, it, it creates a draft effect and all that. So placing the building on top of a hillock is important. So it, you catch the drop from all directions, right? Uh, so the, the greenery, the terrain is very important. And most important because you understand the landfall and also the undulating surfaces. Now, because of the land, you can see from this section going, this is the this is a section of the, it's a very simple one story building, and then you see the land is falling this way. It falls down this way to the pond at the bottom, and that's where the street is. So from the street, you're actually going up to the top of the now where the hill, and that's where the house is. Okay. And here is a little sketch <coughs> to show the how the undulation of the land is, and how we have ensured that we do not do any excavation. <coughs> We have kept the ground naturally following the original stone. <coughs> and we have tried to demonstrate how good it is with all the trees. Now, when you don't cut <coughs> the, the, the land, you save a lot of cost. A lot of projects, a lot of the cost goes up because they start to level with the site. Now, when you look at this picture, you see at this side, uh, you see this side, you are about, at that point, standing point, you can touch the awning roof. But when you get to this end, you are almost at two stories high, as this picture will show. You see at one end, standing here, you can touch this, but at that end, when the land slopes out, you cannot touch it. So, this is the sort of a situation. And I think it's very important because then we are creating a design that fits into the environment. Now, very few projects do that. A lot of projects, they come, the first thing they do is they flatten the site. Even before you start, you already incur a lot of cost in the construction. Here are some more drawings indicating how the, the, the forests are, uh, how much trees we have around the place. And note the large overhanging eaves of the of the of the building to show off the rain and to provide shading for the sun. Now, in the tropics, we have two seasons. The first season is hot and wet. The other season is hot, wet, and more wet. I don't know, Bangalore, how many seasons you have there? Because we have four. I know I was told that in Dhaka they have about eight seasons. I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> so there you are. Now, uh, we have to be very sympathetic to the site and we've got to understand the site very carefully because the site and the natural features there provide us with clues as to what the design should be. Every design that we create for a, a, a building must rise on the ground. And how can it rise from the ground and be symbiotically related to the ground unless you understand the energy from the ground? So this is what in, in, in the Chinese call this uh, energy from, from the earth and all as feng shui. I think in India, you call it bastu. So you've got to understand a little bit of this sort of a thing because there are a lot of uh, energies around which affects our life, and we must understand that. Now, these are three pictures of the house. Now, what is very interesting is this site, as you see at this present moment, is not 
the original site. This was not the site where it was built, but about six years ago, <clears throat> someone bought this house from the challenger. And what they did, they dismantled the whole house and re-erected it this site. It's not a rubber estate or whatever, but it's undulating. And you can see, because of the methodology of the construction where we use the traditional joints and so forth, the building could be dismantled and reconnected, re-erected. And it's in perfect condition. Uh, uh, about three years ago, a uh, group of uh, people from the Aga Khan uh, uh, Institute had an annual conference in Kuala Lumpur and they all wanted to see this building. So they visited the house and these are some of the pictures that they took and they were very happy to see that this house, instead of being demolished, had actually been re-elected. This is the house in the original location in the rubber estate. You can see all these old rubber trees. Huh? These are all old rubber trees. But as time went on, I think they, they cut more and more. Now, important in architecture is we must always approach our building with a certain amount of purpose. We, we, we can call it the visual activist, we can call it the professional group, whatever it is, but it is important. And especially in a site like the Salinger, where there are three acres of old rubber trees, you know, we must observe the nature and how we can fit in with the surrounding trees. Of course, not forgetting where the sunrise, the sunset, the wind direction, and so forth. Uh, many architects tend to forget where the north point is, and they proceed without understanding where the, the sunrise should be sunset. Because in looking at the Chinese feng shui or bad in, in, in your Indian culture, you must know the orientation. So that's important. And also, from my point of view of sustainable architecture, you know, this natural ventilation and so forth. Orientation is very important. Okay, so that is what 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 we have. Huh? Now you see, this is a cross section showing uh, the building. How when it's planning with design, the underside there will be lots of air movement, and then it comes to the central void space and goes up to the top. And then at the center of the the, the, the core, we have this roof light that allows light to come through. And then of course all the rooms around has a lot of ventilation and all that. So this house literally breathe with, uh, with with nature. And when 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 it was being considered for the Aga Khan Award, when the, the, the technical reviewer came, they, they, they were told that the electricity bill for this house was so low and it was really surprised, as well as uh, a lot of other costs. Now, this is a view of what it was like. Huh? It is a nice processional approach right at the top of the hill, uh, the trees on both sides, and sitting there with the sunlight. That's what it's all about. And these are all the different views, different angles at different times of the day. And you see, with the sun, strong sun at the topic, we have this shading area, the lit, sun lit area, shaded area, the shaded area, the sun lit area, shaded area. So you can you, you can look at a building and you know which part of the building is cool, which part is hot. This is one of the dichotomies between people living in the tropics and people from temperate zones. You see, when it, if you're walking around in Malaysia, you know this. All the people who are working out the sun with no shirts on, taking in the sun, are always the European. Whilst the locals are never out in the sun. The locals are always hiding in the shade. You, you, get, you, get, you get Malaysians hiding here under that uh, and all that. Whilst the white man will be out here lazing in the sun and all that. 
It's interesting. That's where we can see eye to eye. Then, as a matter of ventilation, instead of helping this see, they're solid, we have them slatted so that air can come through the side, air can come through the bottom, and also, when the seats are done this way, when you rain, water do not get collected on the seats, but water just goes through the side and runs away. And also because it is flattened, uh, it, it dries up much faster after the rain, so the sun comes up and your timber never rot. Now these are little junction details that we must know. This comes with the knowledge of construction. If you don't know construction, you can't do anything, okay? <clears throat> then, with construction, you are able to create all these interesting details and structures. You see, now, see, the column is here. There's another column here. Here, I've got a beam. Here, we've got another beam. So, this, this, this framing here creates an interesting ceremonial art within the building. Then, you look at all this, uh, what do you call, all these rafters, they are all in, in a very symmetrical manner that they create a pattern, a decorative pattern because it reflects the structure. So the beauty of the interior of your building of your structure is you see what you get and you get what you see. And all part of the integration of structure construction Aesthetic. Now, some of my projects, there was once we were designing a hotel, timber based hotel. So my client got an ID. So I told him, I said, Why do you need an ID? He said, Oh, you know, hotel, we must have an ID. I said, fine, that's fine. So we got, they got in the ID, but with all our intricate uh, detailing, like, like what you see here, this sort of detail connections and all that. Now, what can an ID do in this space? As you can see the picture on the left. Can the, how can an ID improve this? Or for that matter, how can an ID improve this detail here? You can't, because there's nothing left for the ID to do. All right? So you know what happened in the end? The ID's job became designing a floor pattern using mosaic tiles to create a, car, a, 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 a mosaic carpet. Now, that's great, isn't it? They say, so this is why architect, you must design your building in such a way that there's no room for ID to come in and stuff up your design. You must think creatively from the inside to the outside. Today, too many architects are only involved in designing the outside. Oh, shape, oh, all that. Oh, I love the window to be this shape. They Google, look into the internet. Oh, I like this shape. They take tongue and they cut and paste. That's not architecture. Architecture has to evolve from the inside. <clears throat> it's a passion. If you cannot do that, give up being an architect and don't call yourself designer. Because you want to be a designer, you start designing a cube first. A 25 mm by 25 mm by 25 mm cube. Then you try and design a 25 meter by 25 meter cube. Then tell me you are a good designer. Okay, it's a challenge. I think this is a subject. This should be a design topic for every third year student in your college. That every semester you get them design something like that. And I promise you, their thinking would become much better than what they are now. They will to bridge the IIC. Give them a try. Okay, so now the site and the environment will set the tone for your design. This is so that your design reflects the, the environment, right? And, and that's very important. So it must have a major influence on the design. Okay, now I tell you what, maybe if I can move my computer and then it's come without disrupting it, I just want to let you have a look at what I have here in my workspace to give you an idea of the environment. Okay, see this? It, we've got a space that is inside and that is outside. Okay, 
they all these are operable wall, walls, components. They're all in canvas. Right? See that? And, and look at the, the shadow that's cast on the screen. Every day we got a different shadow. And it's so interesting. It's gratifying. All right. So uh, I, I think we are still on. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. So that's what it is. And I think in the Salinger's house, the most, most greatest influence <coughs> on our design was the pristine rubber forest. You know, whenever I get an environment like that, it's such an inspiration. And I promise you, boys and girls, when you guys get a chance, you find real fun. This was what it looked like when it was being built. Look at the forest. Look at all the rubber trees <coughs> around. Huh? All the trees. And undergrowth and all that. And you can see this building coming out. Now, interestingly, this house took about six years to build. Now, six years is a long time. But then, the, 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 the carpenter, contractor, who was doing this job, could only work <coughs> four months in a year on the project because he comes from that part of, of Malaysia where he's, he's a petty rice farmer. So during the harvesting season and all that, he's got to be back home to do all that. And it's only after the, the, the planting of the, 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 the rice and other things you know, uh, that he has time to come down to Kuala Lumpur to build the house. So six, six months, no, four months in a year. So <clears throat> if you multiply six years, four months, that's only... 24 months. So it only took, really, if he had worked on it constantly, it wouldn't be two years. So I think that's really not bad, huh? considering the complexity and the amount of craftsmanship that's involved. So this is a picture of the building as it was built. Here is the central core. <laughs> See, there's a central core coming up. This is a, this, the, the stair and the central core, a concrete frame, and then in between the frame, it's filled with stone, rubble, rubble stone, so they form a kind of like a wall in a castle. And then from this solid uh, stone wall, all the other timber structures sort of uh, expand out. This is building halfway up. <coughs> you can see that a lot of the rubber trees have all been cleared around here. The undergrowth is now not so wild. Uh, that's the stone wall and all these are the timber bits and pieces sticking out from the structure. <coughs> now, I'd like you to note this part here. You see, these are the seats. The seats for the, for the deck. Now, normally, most people would just have railing around the deck prevent children from falling over or other adults from falling over. But in what, what, what we like to do is, we, we like to say, okay, uh, instead of having just railing, which serves no purpose, because anyway, when you walk out the deck, when you stand on railing, you like to look out there and all. So we thought, well, why don't we convert this railing onto seats and make it Easily, so people can go out there, sit, sit on these seats which were the railing before and enjoy the evening and enjoy the breeze. And that's how this thing came about. And this has been one of the features in all our designs. We always use this uh, and that's it, okay? Now, in analyzing the elements, we find that it's very important because it contributes to the sustainability of our design. Now, we were doing sustainable architecture even before other people. 
talk about green architecture, renewable energy architecture, sustainable architecture, and so forth. Let me tell you, as far as I'm concerned, sustainable architecture and energy and architecture with renewable resources is has got nothing to do with GBI. GBI is a con game to get you to spend more money, <clears throat> to get you to spend money on those expensive new inventions which comes from the West. And you know, the sort of things that's happening in the US now, you get to see, it's all big con. You know, we, we are all con by the whole thing. And I really hope that before long, the Indians will take over the United States because uh, all the financial institutions belong, uh, are being controlled by top Indian CEOs and so forth. So I, I think you've got a good chance of taking over the United States. I don't know whether they want to do that. No mind. Anyway, <clears throat> in, 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 in looking at the sustainability, you always have to keep the sun out, keep the rain out, let the wind in and so forth. So when there are lots of rain, you need to have a roof. But then when the sun comes up, you also need to have the roof <coughs> to cover you. When it rains, you need the wall. But when it doesn't rain, you don't need the wall. So where is the, 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 the I said, there's always a conflict. Sun control is important. The building must breathe. The sanitary house is a building that breathes with the natural environment. Okay, and that's very important. And also, we never use gutters. You know gutters, those things that you put around your roof, they are one of the most idiotic inventions. Whoever invented it and whoever used it, they did. I, when I started my practice back here in Kuala Lumpur in 1978, by, 1970, by 1980, I stopped using gutters. When I submitted my plans, the authorities said, oh, your drawings have, your design has got no gutter. How come? I said, why should I have gutter? Oh, you must have gutter. I said, any of our vernacular architecture, any of our kampong, village houses have gutters? And they start to think, oh, oh, you are right, huh? There are no gutters. So I said, so if we have got no gutters, then why are we asking for gutters? After day after, they accepted that all my designs have no gutters. And I am happy to say, about 10 years ago, Singapore BCA, Building Control Authorities, finally introduced a rule that there will be no gutters allowed in Singapore or downpipes. Because they realized gutters rot, downpipes collect water, mosquitoes breed, and that's how you get dengue fever. It, it, well, see, the fact that Singapore government did it 10 years ago mitigate my thinking. Oh, I'm very proud of that. All done in such a way that get a let in between water to come through. Oh, and here, huh? also, and look at all the slats, you get light coming through and all that. So that's very important. And as a structural element, huh, we, our structure is triangulation. So everything is triangulated in this sort of manner, following the whole philosophy and the layout of the structural system. And you can only do that if you understand structures and you understand construction. So you can only be a designer when you start to know what you're talking about, how to put bits and pieces together, okay? So look at the close-up, <clears throat> look at uh, this detail. These are slides to allow light to come through, let water to seep through. Here the same thing, look at all this. Uh, everywhere we, we, we have orifice slats to let water on. And then because of slats, you have shadow cast on the ground. So I don't need to have any patterns on the floor. The sun creates the pattern here, the sun creates pattern there, and so forth. Right? That's architecture. Now, these are all elements to show you the overhanging eaves and so forth and so forth, and how the, the building is so open. If you look at the, stack, the seats here, these are the seats, and these are the 
structural members, we should have been the, uh, the, the, the balustrade. Now, the most important aspect is construction. Uh, a lot of designers say, oh, I design. How are you going to create, build what you've designed? You must know how to construct it. You must know who to get to build it. You must know construction, you must know structures, and you must know how to build it. You must know the cost, and you must know the experience of the people. Huh? And that's what it's all about, isn't it? Huh? So, uh, this is something which I always emphasize, that schools must teach students about this, because it is part and parcel of your materiality. What are you using? How you're going to fit it together to create, to show off the form, the, the, the character uh, of the material. That's very important. Traditionally, our people used to do it very well, but today we don't because we Google. We Google, we internet. Everything is Google, Google. I tell you what, one day when Google collapse, after 5G comes in, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, India have to come up with some Udo or Udos. No more Google, Udo, Udo, you know? Okay? So you guys got to think on. Now, this man here, the man who you saw just now receiving the award from <clears throat> the Aga Khan is Adam, Pak Adam. If you notice, he has no right hand. All right? Can you see that? He's got no right hand there. He's only got a left hand. And he is blind in his left eye. Now, when he was a young man, <clears throat> he was doing dynamite fishing. And I think one of, this, one of those days, the dynamite exploded in his hand and he lost his hand and he blind his hand. But... Despite his handicap, this man has what, amazing tenacity. He carried on. He never allowed that to stop. How many people can be like him? I tell you, I really respect him. Until today, I'm so honored that I have met him in my life. Right? Now, when... The client was looking for a contractor to build a house. We spoke to many people and lots of people, the moment they saw that it was triangular in shape, they cannot do, they quoted high prices and so forth. But when a friend of Dallinger took the plans <coughs> all the way up north to the Thai border, the border with Thailand, and met up with him and showed him the layout and told him this is a, a, a timber house, is a Malay house, but it's a little bit different. So they showed him the plan. He said, so there you are, it's triangle. What do you think? But once you, he looked at it, you know what he said? If whoever drew it can draw it, if they can draw it, I can build it. Oh boy, now it's, isn't, isn't that a fantastic attitude? If they can draw it, I can build it. How many people are like that today? The first thing, oh, no, it's too difficult. No, oh, no, I can't. I don't have the time. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, you know, my mother wouldn't allow me. Oh, no, no, my girlfriend wouldn't allow me. Oh, you know, all sorts of things. That's what's going to, that's the downfall of this world. Anyway, I sadly, <clears throat> Craftsman like him, carpentry is a dying trade. In fact, a lot of the craftsmanship has lost. Right? And how are we going to search for people like that? Very difficult. And the engineers, how do we get engineers? The engineer that we had was just a normal engineer who, 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 um, who suggested that the structure should all be connected using steel plates and bolts. And we said, what? You can't do that. He said, well, if you want me to submit plan, you have to do that. So we had to go with him. But 
Anyway, God was kind when <coughs> Mark Adam saw the layout, the design. He said, I am not going to use steel. Oh, really? Now that's interesting. We are going to use traditional joints, dovetail joints, hidden dovetail joints, uh, mortise and tenon down and say, oh, I tell you, it was music to our ears. So here you can see one of his guy chipping away with simple tools, huh? chisel and a hammer, mallet. Oh no, this is not mallet. It's the side of an X and he's making a hole in here so that that hole can be, that, that, that becomes a mortise for a tenon. Then the tenon is always in the shape of a dovetail and it's hidden. Right? So you can fit in the, 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 the dovetail and slot it in and you can remove it. And that's how this whole house was removed, relocated five years ago, okay? So that is a sort of connection that they were able to make. Now, isn't it fantastic? Look at the, how clean they're able to cut this thing. Now, the other one interesting thing I want to tell you is we have designed this column to be 10-sided. I forget what's the reason, but we did. And, and they were able to carve all these things in. You see, this big slot here is for a, a beam. A beam was to come right across here. Then there's another beam that will join this column and there's another beam that will join here. And you can see this is a dovetail, the dovetail detail, and then it sits down. And at the moment, there's a little chamfer that goes in so that when the dovetail goes in, it stays locked, it cannot pull it out. And the weight of the building holds everything in place. <laughs> you see, this is a, a junction, all right? So. The, the, the slot for the long beam goes here, then this is for a short beam, and that's for a short beam. So you've got a dovetail here, a dovetail joint here, a dovetail joint here, and a dovetail joint, and this is a cross beam that goes right across. So that's how it is. And <clears throat> uh, at the joists, I suspect these joists, they had to nail, because they are not very big members, but everything else, the major joints were all traditional structure. <clears throat> this is the framing for the gazebo. It's triangular shape and it's got three ridges, okay, meeting at an apex and sitting on a triangulated ring beam supported, propped up by rafters. Now, the most, see here is a burst mouth. The, 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 the rafter sits over the beam in a joint called bird mouth. And here is a complex detailing of an interlocking dovetail with a dowel key to hold the thing together. So, when these three members, rich, rich members, or no, these three hip members are interlocked and the key inserted, the thing is held permanently. So they do this by erecting it on the ground, dry it up, and then dismantle and re-erect it on the side. I mean, it's very professional. And these are guys from the villages. It's not like they went to some university for a degree and things like, you know, today's university students with degrees, do not do things like that. Sad to say, it's a fact. Look at all this joint, and that, that, that's a, the, the picture on the left, let's get the, the detail. This is how we sort of, you know, make note of their detail. And these are all the joints, okay? <clears throat> then, <clears throat> you know, the ventilation is an important thing. Look at the detailing for this ventilation. I'll just three members this way and three members here. 
the Malay call this three friends. Tiga Sekawan. Three friends. You know, it, it, it's wonderful because in, in the Malay uh, tradition and culture, they have a lot of these very, very affectionate, uh, friendly uh, names. And this is definitely one of them. So here you can see how the, the, the junctions are met. Everything is so neat and so forth. So the question is, if that's the way our building is done, do I still need an interior designer? I doubt it. So architects, we must remember that at the end of the day, we must know what we're talking about in order to talk about design. So to make a building to be a success, these are some of the elements you've got to look at. And therefore, I thought instead of just talking, like, talking about the philosophy of this and all that, that I enlighten and share with you what went into making the Salinger's house that won the Aga Khan Award in 1998. And uh, just for your information, uh, the principal jury that was looking at the winners was Zaha Hadid. Zaha Hadid was the one that said, this house must win because you could see a lot of uh, architectural merit in it. And they felt that uh, it's something that was ahead of his time and his, uh, his, the ideas can speak for a long time. So anyway, that's the end of part one. Uh, I will continue part two. Uh, next Thursday, I hope you all will still be joining us. Okay, thank you very much for attending. I look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And it's a project with BBC. The carpentry is a rare find and so the solution is Yes, sir. Sir, are you there? Okay. There, there's a question. Yeah. We have a couple of questions, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'll just... Uh... Okay. Uh, the first question being, with the extensive use of wood, what kind of treatment was given to the wood to withstand the climatic conditions? Uh, this type of wood, <clears throat> I forgot to mention, is called Chengao. Okay. Chengao. Um, traditionally, it was used for building boats. You know, those big boats, Tongkang and things like that. Uh, now, when this house was built, this wood was about 150 ringgit a ton. Today, this wood, it costs more than 8,000 ringgit a ton. It's like gold. Uh, I don't know why, but it's a very durable uh, wood. It doesn't get attacked by termite. It's water resistant. Uh, it's very dense. And uh, it's not easy to work with. Okay, sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll take one more question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the Salinger house was dismantled and re-erected as it is uh, in almost okay. the same... Yeah. Uh, uh, you're breaking up. Can you repeat that again, please? Yes, yes. So, you, uh, in the presentation, it was mentioned that the Salinger house was dismantled and re-erected re again at a different site. Yes. So you mentioned about the dovetailed detailed which helped in the relocation. What were the other parameters? What were the other parameters that were considered during relocation, like for the foundation and everything? Oh, so, uh, I lost your, your last part. The last one. What were the other parameters that were considered during the relocation part, like the about the foundation and everything? Any oh, other okay. I was not involved in the relocation, so okay. I do not know what transpired. But all I can say is, report is, 
the final product at the new site looked quite presentable. And the Aga Khan uh, Institute, huh? people who visited it were very happy. Yes, definitely. Uh, okay, uh, now I'd like to invite our speaker, Dr. K. Ganesh Prabhu, to say a few words to you. Sorry, I, I didn't hear that. Now, our principal, uh, Dr. K. Ganesh Babu, sir, will be joining us to share a few words. He's yours, sir. Over to you, sir. Over to you. Maybe you can take this off. All right. Uh, I think it, it was indeed an excellent uh, presentation. And uh, you are a legend, sir. You have uh, uh, demonstrated things so well that right from your demonstration of the cube, your uh, demonstration of the topography, the climatic conditions, the joinery details. In fact, it was really appropriate for the students of all the batches, if I should be specific. And uh, all our faculty members are very happy that they have, you have covered a great part of their uh, uh, session, the syllabus. It was really relevant. And, and I'm sure that the second part will be a little uh, oriented towards the sustainable part. Yes, I, yes. I thank, yeah, I, I thank you for uh, accepting our invitation readily and being with us <coughs> on behalf of management, staff and students of Aditya Academy. I extend my sincere thanks to you. And I'm sure in the next presentation, we will have a bigger crowd to spectate your uh, explanations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you for joining with yes. us. It, it, it's, it's always a pleasure to share ideas with young minds. And I think it's very important that we share a common responsibility in educating our young people towards the right direction. Uh, we all share the same global family. I, I appreciate I appreciate your way of uh, going to the minute uh, intricate details of your work and uh, enlightening our students. Thank you, sir, and uh, we will meet up next week at the same time. Yes. Okay. Good, good. Thank you. Over to Neha. Thank you, sir. It was an honor to have you, uh, dear participants. As announced earlier, Dr. Jimmy Lim will be joining us again on six June Thursday for part two of this lecture. So make sure to mark your calendars. With this, we'll conclude today's session. Please note that tomorrow's incubation webinar is at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye, sir. Thank you and bye. Hmm?